Father, we ask that you would meet us this morning as we think about what it means to be saints, what it means to be faithful, even what it means to be uh, those who live in a city, maybe much like the city of Colossae in some ways. What it means for us to be tempted by certain things that the enemy was also tempting the church at Colossae by. God, would you help us to hear your word this morning? Would you help me to be faithful, to preach it effectively, to preach it faithfully to the text, to preach it in line with how you would want it preached this morning? God, would you meet us as a church? Would you be glorified in our midst as we spend time thinking about you and your word this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you all and to continue now in our time in the book of Colossians together. This is now our our second Sunday In the book of Colossians, we plan to spend, as Jason alluded to, we plan to spend some time in the book of Colossians. I'm thinking eight to nine months will probably be in this book, looking carefully at each verse as as much as we can, slowing down whenever we can. And right in line with what I just said, we spent last week looking at verse one, just verse one, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. We didn't even get to Timothy, which we'll talk about him as the letter goes on. But today we're going to look at just verse two. And we're going to ask the question, who is the book of Colossians written to? Who are these people? What is the city of Colossae? And we're going to talk a little bit about what Paul, how Paul addresses them here as saints and faithful brothers in Christ. So that's our, that's what we're trying to do. We're going to take it slow. And then next week we'll begin the letter as a whole. So we'll begin the greeting and going forward with that. So this is kind of an orientation sermon, if you will, to kind of get us zeroed in on who is it that we're talking about when we talk about this particular people who lived at this particular time in this particular place. So here's the main point. I don't want to spend any time... uh, On the intro, I just want us to go right into the main point, and I want us to see a couple of things here. And here's the main point. It may be surprising to you, given what I just said. Here's here's what I'd like us to pull from this sermon. A church that is content with what Jesus gives will stand in the face of false teaching. A church that is content with what Jesus gives will stand in the face of false teaching. Essentially, this morning, what we're going to hear and we're going to see in our text is that contentment, being content with Jesus alone as the fulfiller and the filler of our lives is actually the best way we can stand against all of the, all of the stuff that's out there, all the stuff the enemy wants to throw your way, all the stuff that the world has, has as their worldview that they want to bring to you. A, a simple Holy contentment with Jesus and who he is is a powerful defense against those kind of things. So hopefully we'll see that. You'll see that in the text this morning as we get there and as we talk a little bit about the book of Colossians. Let's look at our text. Let's look at verse 2. Paul says, To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, and then, of course, he gives the standard greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father. And here's how I want to start. Paul says he writes to the saints and the faithful brothers in Christ. Now, the word saint for most of us sort of conjures up an idea of a very specialized Christian, a Christian who is sort of super Christian, if you want to call it that. These the saints in our minds, at least how it's come to be known in the world around us, and oftentimes how it even comes into our minds, are the super Christians that have gone out and done amazing things. Very often our first reaction for many of us, if somebody asks, are you a saint? Is a no, 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 I'm not a saint. Somebody else is a saint because they've done better and more spiritual things than I have. Maybe a missionary somewhere who's gone off and, and gone to an unreached people group. Those are the saints. They've gone out and they've done amazing things for God. 
and we don't think of ourselves as saints. But here's what's important to remember as we come to this first word, this word saints that Paul uses, by the way, for the whole church of Colossae. It's important to remember that a lot of how we have come to the word saints, how we think about the word saints, actually comes through Roman Catholic teaching. So if you've ever been to a Catholic church, perhaps some of you have a background in Catholicism, or you have family members who have a background in Catholicism. Roman Catholic teaching is actually responsible for where a lot of us get this idea that a saint is a super Christian, somebody who's gone above and beyond in their, in their Christianity. So I want to talk a little bit about church history for a moment here. I want to talk about where the word saint developed and why it is that if you ask a random person out in our world today, they'll probably tell you that saints are a few special holy people that have existed throughout history. Where did that come from? How did that actually develop in the church. So let's take a minute to talk about a little bit of her, a church history. You see, in the early church, just, just a couple decades after this book was written, persecution would break out in the church. The Roman government began to discover what Christianity was and what it was all about. And that was, of course, filled with a lot of false beliefs about Christianity. But some of the things they were concerned about were real, were true. For instance, they began to realize there was this group of people who believed that Jesus was Lord, not Caesar, which was the way you typically said it as a Roman, as a Roman citizen or as a, somebody in, under Rome. You, you would say, Caesar is Lord. Well, here you have a group of people rising up saying, Jesus is Lord. And this bothered them. And it bothered them so much that they began, a few decades after the book of Colossians, a systemic persecution of Christianity. And churches were being, uh, whole churches were being arrested at times during these persecutions. And they would oftentimes, this is a bit gruesome, but they would put a sword to you and they would hold it up to you and they would say, are you going to claim the name of Jesus as Lord or is Caesar Lord? Okay, and you had a mixed decision group at that point. You had two groups. Once the sword had been drawn and put to the neck, you had a group of people that in that moment, when they were asked, the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to be able to stand and to say, Jesus is Lord, often to the point of either losing their head, losing their property, being arrested, sometimes being tortured for their faith. They would stand, and the word back then was they would confess. That doesn't mean I'm telling you all my sins. That's not what it means there. It meant they were confessing that Jesus was Christ in the middle of their persecution. And they were called back then the confessors. That was to be a confessor in the early church meant you had stood up under threats and persecution and even torture, and you still existed in the church that day because maybe they didn't end up killing you in the long run. So there were confessors in the church, and the Holy Spirit had given them the ability in that moment to stand. But there was another group of people. There was a group of people that when the sword came out and the threats were made, they caved. They gave in to what was being asked of them. They actually denied Jesus in the midst of the threats. They actually were told very often to do some kind of sacrifice or bow the knee to some kind of statue, and they did. And as they did, they were spared. Their lives were spared, but the guilt remained, and the guilt was thick upon these people. These people were called the lapsed, okay? The word lapsed means fallen, the ones who had fallen away when the time came. And so you had within the church confessors amazing people that God had given, uh, the Holy Spirit had given a gift to, to be able to stand in that moment. 
and you had those who ashamedly had bowed the knee to Caesar and turned away in that moment from Jesus. And the church was trying to figure out what do we do with the fact that there are people that are coming back to us now sorrowful, mournful, that they didn't stand in the moment. What do we do with these people that are still a part of our church? And unfortunately, what they did, the decision that they made with these two two groups of people, unfortunately, it didn't match with what Scripture said, because what they were concerned with was the fact that these people were coming for a special need of forgiveness, right? Right? This was a real bad crime, sin that they had committed to to deny Jesus. And they said, well, where are we going to get this special forgiveness that is needed for these people? And they said, we got it. There are confessors in our church too. They've done such above and beyond the call of duty that they've done such great works before God that surely his pleasure and his forgiveness from them could be transferred to this other group. So the confessors and their superabundance of grace that they had done from such great works that they had done began to be the means by which the lapsed would actually be able to come back to the faith. That's the way the early church reasoned that out. And this came about 300, 400 A.D., And it developed over the next thousand years into this idea where there were a few people in church history that had gone so far above and beyond the call of duty that their good works would actually be stored somewhere. And you can look this up on Wikipedia. It's called the Treasury of Merit. The Treasury of Merit is where... The the works of Jesus would be stored, and it was also where the works of the saints would be stored. And then when the church wanted to forgive somebody, they would forgive somebody out of the treasury of merit. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, how would they defend themselves biblically from this kind of view? Because I, I hope I don't have to tell you we're off from Scripture right now. We, we are off, and I'll, and I'll explain how and why in a second. But when asked how the Catholic Church would defend themselves from this kind of teaching, they would actually point to Colossians chapter 1. You can look down just a few verses from where you are right now to Colossians 1.24, and here's what they would say. They would use this verse, and they would say this. They would quote this verse. Paul is speaking. He says, now... I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and admit, this is one of those weird verses in the Bible. In other words, this is one of those verses where you, you have to struggle and wrestle with the context, to understand what this verse means. What does it mean to be filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions? Is it saying that Jesus didn't do a good enough job when he went to the cross and died? That there's something else that needs to be done? That Jesus is lacking? Well, no. In context, as we look at it, as we study, it most likely means that God has intended always, always, that his church would be afflicted and would suffer. Because those who follow after the master, Jesus says, those who follow me, Jesus would say, are going to live a life that looks a lot like the life I live. And so Paul sees this great plan of God, and he sees the fact that the church is going to suffer They're going to be afflicted. And Paul says, I'm a part of that. My suffering is a part of that. And he uses this word, filling up what is lacking, as if God says, well, over time, there's going to be a certain amount of suffering the church is going to have to endure. And Paul says, I'm fulfilling some of that in my suffering. And you, in your life, 
might fulfill some of that in your suffering. The church is not a, a, an organization of God that goes forward in triumph and in victory. The church goes forward the way Jesus went forward. We will oftentimes suffer and be afflicted. And that will actually move forward God's plan. And that's what Paul meant there. But the Catholic Church said this. They reasoned like this. Jesus suffered for the forgiveness of sins. So Paul must mean that there's still room for him to do some suffering for the forgiveness of sins. And it began to be this idea that human beings, mere human beings, not Jesus, could suffer for other human beings. And they could actually give to other human beings what they had earned, so to speak, from God. But friends, this is wrong. This is not the way the Bible teaches. This is a misunderstanding of that passage. And it's a mis. It's a mistaken theology that developed a long, long time ago. And unfortunately, it continues into our day to day to where most people don't think of a saint as an ordinary Christian. They think of a saint as a special person who's done special things, who's earned special favor from God. And if you ask the Catholic Church, they'll say you can actually use the saint's favor when you go and forgive another person. We are saints, not because we are special people. And I don't mean none of all of you aren't special, okay? But you're ordinary like I am. You're a regular human being who has trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior. You are a saint. And you're a saint not because you've contributed to the salvation of other people through your good works and merit. We are saints because Christ alone has paid the ultimate price and given everything that we need to be saved. Jesus alone, everything we need to be saved. Listen, not 99.9% .9 of what it takes to be saved. 100% of what it takes to be saved was purchased by Jesus on the cross so that when they said paid in full above him, which is what the sign read when you translate the Greek, that was a true statement. Your sins have been paid in full through his work on the cross. And there is no other human being that contributes to your salvation. So, Whenever we come across the word saints in the Bible, I want the chance to kind of correct the way the world out there thinks and even the way sometimes we are tempted to think when it comes to saints. So who are the saints in verse 2? I've already co covered it. This is every believer in the church of Colossae. Every single man, woman, and child even who has trusted in Jesus is a saint. And then he says that they are faithful. So here's another question. Is it saints? And then there's like faithful saints. There's faithful people and there was the unfaithful people. Is that what he means? The word faithful here isn't a term that separates out super saints from regular saints. Every saint is faithful in that they live out the life that the Holy Spirit has breathed into them, and they're going to do so to one degree or another. Now, here's what, don't, don't misunderstand me here. That doesn't mean that all of us live exactly the same life, and all of us live equally pleasing to God, okay? You all can grow, as can I, in being more pleasing in how we live, more saying no to the world and yes to Him. However, everything you guys do for God is a work of the Holy Spirit that he has done in you. And so to one degree or another, we are living out the life that God has called us to by the power of the Holy Spirit and are therefore faithful, not because of our own merits again, but because of what the Holy Spirit has done. So there are the saints and the faithful. And then he says brothers. And now we're confused about that too, because why is he just talking about the men? Why just the men here? Now listen, brothers is not some exclusionary term that's only identifying the males within the group. In the Greek, the word meant brothers and sisters. In much the same way for you Spanish speakers out there, if I say ellos, 
That means them or they, who am I referring to? I'm referring to men and women in the crowd, but the ending of that word is a masculine ending. Okay, so there are languages that will use the masculine form to talk about the men and women mixed within a group. Okay, and so that's what the Greek is doing here. It's saying brothers and sisters who are saved, who have trusted in Christ, you are the saints and the faithful. So here's the main point or one of the points if you're taking notes. Every true Christian is a saint because of Christ and faithful because of the Holy Spirit. Every one of you has the work of Christ accomplished for you, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you, which is enabling faithfulness. So these are the saints and faithful brothers in Christ. But then it says, in Colossae. Let's remember that this book was written not to all faithful saints everywhere that live at all times. This book was first and foremost written to the faithful saints and the the saints and faithful brothers who live in a particular city in a particular time period. Okay, so we're talking about Colossae now, and it would be good for us to understand a little bit about what this town was and what, who, who was in this town and what did they think about and what was their, what was their sort of worldview and their, their, uh, their sort of psychology that they had. Let's talk a bit about this city. Um, let, me, let me start by saying this. I, I went to just do a lot of research on the city of Colossae this week because I knew this sermon was coming up. And what's interesting is that there's actually not a lot of research on Colossae. Okay? So Colossae is not very well known. Okay? For instance, it's really interesting. Colossae's never been, they've never dug it up. Like they've never gone down and actually excavated Colossae. If you go to Ephesus, okay, which I have been to Ephesus, you can walk amongst the original columns where 2,000 years ago, you can go into the amphitheater where Paul defended himself against the, the, the artisans of, of Artemis that were upset at him. Okay, you can walk into those very places. Colossae, you can do none of that. They think maybe there's a stone there from a church that existed in like 400 AD. That's the best you can get. You got nothing. There's nothing there because they've never dug down and actually gone up and dug it up. And I don't know the answer why. I tried to look. For whatever reason, the Turkish government has shut down any archaeological digs for the city of Colossae. So... We don't have a lot. That doesn't mean we have nothing. Here's what we know. We know Colossae was not a big city like Ephesus was in that day. Ephesus was the capital city of that entire region of the world. Rome would have been the capital city of the whole world, or at least the Greek-speaking world at that time. Ephesus would have been number two, and it was massive, and it was cosmopolitan. Colossae was about 120 miles from Ephesus to the east. It would have been about the distance from Ephesus that San Diego is from us. And so considering that there were no cars or anything like that, you, you would, it would be a considerable distance to travel to Colossae from Ephesus. And so Colossae was not quite the big city that Ephesus was. But here's what I can tell you. Colossae was actually originally a town that was a massively wealthy trade town. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it was good if you had a city on a trade route, right? You wanted to have a city on a trade route because the traders would come by and they would stop at your city and they would usually buy and sell in the process. They needed goods and supplies and they would usually offer their wares and your city would grow if you could actually be on a trade route. Colossi had the ability back then when they were originally founded to be on two trade routes. Okay? They were on the crossroads of an east-west trade route and a north-south trade route, meaning that this city at one point in its history was fabulously wealthy because everybody would come through Colossae. 
Everybody would be there. And they would have stuff from the Far East. They would have stuff from all over the world coming through Colossae. Even though they weren't massive, they were going to be a very wealthy merchant city. Now, a few decades before Paul writes, the Roman government makes a decision. And they say, we are going to take the north-south trade route, and we're actually going to move the entire thing 12 miles to the west. Okay? So they redo the roads, and the new road doesn't go through Colossae anymore. Okay? Instead, it goes through a town called Laodicea. Anybody recognize Laodicea from the Bible? Laodicea was a town 12 miles to the west of Colossae, and Laodicea got the benefit. I don't know if they had politicians living in that town. They got the benefit of the new road where they became the new crossroads of trade. And it had been several decades since then that they had experienced this boon, this development of their city as all of the traders would have now had to stop in Laodicea and not Colossae, which meant what? Laodicea was on the rise wealth-wise. Colossae was on the decline. Now, to me, that's fascinating Because if you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus has some things to say to Laodicea. You guys know Laodicea was one of the churches Jesus wrote to in the book of Revelation. They're the church, if you probably know this verse, they're the church where he says, you are lukewarm, you're neither hot nor cold for me. You are lukewarm and I'm ready to spit you out of my mouth. Really intense. Really intense passage there. He says that to the church in Laodicea. Here's something else he says. Think about this, considering the history that we now know about the trade route and the development. He says, for you say, I am rich. I have prospered. And I need nothing. And Jesus says, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus is speaking to a city where their wealth is on the rise. This is, if you might allow me to say it, this is new money. You guys know new money? New money is where you've come into money all of a sudden, and you're so excited about it, you want everybody to know about it, and it becomes the thing that you think about more than anything else. This is new money in the city of Laodicea. And Jesus speaks to them, and he has the kind of things to say to them that you would say, that Jesus would say to a rich community of people. He says, you have found yourself in a place where because of your great wealth, you don't think you need me anymore. And I would say, just by way of application, Be careful, especially those of us that maybe have some means. And by the way, I know I'm speaking to mostly middle class here, but you know what's hard about being middle class? You're going to experience both of the temptations that I'm going to bring up this morning. Because there are times in your life where you will have means. There are times in your life where you will feel very wealthy, perhaps compared to the people around you. And there will also be times in your life where you feel like you don't have anything. Jesus says to the wealthy, which could include you in this room, he says, be careful when your great wealth keeps you from needing me, keeps you from recognizing your, what are the words he used? Pitiable, wretched, poor, blind. Do you remember the words that Jesus used when he talks about in his Sermon on the Mount? He says, blessed are the who? The poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? There's a humility in poverty of spirit. There's a humility that knows to go to Jesus with my needs. And he says to the rich, be really careful. In fact, there are certain rich people in the Bible, which Jesus looks at them and he says, sell it all. He didn't say that to everybody. That's not every wealthy person Jesus comes across in the Bible. But he looked at one man in particular the rich young ruler, and he said, sell it all. Why? 
He knew what was in that man's heart. He knew that his great wealth would prevent him from trusting in Christ. And he says, sell it all if you have to, to trust in me. So that's Jesus's words to the wealthy. That's Jesus's words to a a city that's on the rise, to a community of people that seem to be growing in their wealth. What about Colossae? Well, by logic, if Laodicea is on the rise because of their great position on the trade route, Colossae is on the decline. Colossae is a church that had wealth, perhaps. Perhaps there are families still living in the city that remember a day where things were a lot better than they currently are right now. And we find now Paul speaking to a city that is not a rich city. Not wealthy on the terms of Laodicea. It was filled with a people who longed perhaps for that day where their wealth would be great again like it once was. Colossae might be considered to what we call today the other side of the tracks compared to Laodicea. Like, oh, don't go to Colossae. That's the bad part of town, right? Compared to the wealthy Laodiceans. It might be similar to in our country when we consider places like the Rust Belt. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. This is some states in the United States, Illinois, Indiana, right? You've got Ohio, Pennsylvania. These states are places that once boomed with industry. And now as you go here, these towns are in poverty, okay? These are places like Detroit, where there once was a fantastic, amazing car, car manufacturing industry in Detroit. And now there are people who lost their jobs and are, some of them are destitute, Those are cities on the decline, much like Colossae would be. Now, surely, there were some wealthy people in this town, but the city was mostly made up of people, as we can understand it, who were not wealthy. Now, here's what I want to say by way of application of this. Just as there is a unique temptation for the rich to feel that they don't need God, There is a temptation for those who are not rich, and it is this. You are tempted to covet what you don't have. That would be the unique temptation for those who are not fabulously wealthy. Covetousness. Now, you might be saying to me, well, rich people can covet too. Absolutely. They certainly can. Because one of the things about being rich and being wealthy and having money is it never quite satisfies And so you never quite have enough of it. And so even wealthy people can covet. However, however, it is something uniquely, it is something pretty pretty special and unique that will happen to those who don't and perceive themselves as not being wealthy. I want to be. I want to seek after that wealth. That's the temptation. That's what comes upon us when we don't have it. Now listen to what Paul says to the book of Colossians, in the book of Colossians here, to the Colossian people. He says in Colossians 3, 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Which he says, which is idolatry. Paul sees in the people of Colossae an idolatry. I think it has to do with something to the effect of, I'm not being fulfilled. I don't have what I need in this life. There's a kind of an idolatry that they have wrapped themselves up in. And Paul has to remind them that it is idolatry to covet what you don't have. That's idolatry, he says. Just as much as you can sin with riches, if you're wealthy, you can sin in poverty through covetousness. I want to be wealthy so badly that I'll do whatever it takes to be able to get there. One thing we have to remember is this. The poor are not more virtuous than the rich. Sometimes we think that way. Sometimes we consider it. There's lots of stories that say somebody who's in poverty is going to generally be wiser and make better decisions. They just have different temptations. Wealthy people have certain temptations and poorer people have other temptations. And we've got to keep that in mind. We're all humans here. We all sin 
in different ways. And as I said, if you're middle class, you probably have both temptations in your life. You probably have felt both of them. Colossi struggled with a desire for more than what God had for them at that moment. Essentially what it is, is that Colossi failed to be content as a people. They failed to be content. And what I believe about the church in Colossae is that this fact set them up for the heresy that came into the church. Okay? The lack of contentment in the Colossian people set them up for a heresy to come in and to spread in their midst. That's my theory. That's what I see as I read this passage and do, this, do the study to try to understand what was going on in this city. I believe that it was lack of contentment that lead to a fault, led to a false teaching taking root in the church. Now, I think the thinking goes something like this. You feel strongly that you're lacking something in your life, Christian. There's something that you're missing. You know, Jesus is great, but what I really want is, and you, you fill in that blank. Jesus satisfies me 90% of the way, but what I really need in my life is, and let the Holy Spirit fill in that blank. Whatever that thing is, even if it's a good thing, even if it's a wonderful thing, if it is not such in your life that Jesus is 100% satisfying to you, then you are going to struggle with contentment. You are going to have something in your life which is like a root that you can't dig out. It's like something that takes root in your heart and it stays there and you long for it. And maybe you haven't told anybody else about it, what you long for, what you want in this life what it really would be to make you happy. It's Jesus, surely, because you're here in this church and there's probably, for many of you, you're saying, yes, I'm a believer. It's Jesus, but it might be Jesus and that thing. It might be one other thing in your life. And Paul says that, that root there is an idol. It is something you are holding on to, not because it's not good to want or be okay, okay or desire good things, but if you say that's what's going to make me happy. And then what happens is the fact that you aren't getting what you want, it's going to lead you to feeling that your life following Jesus has not quite been as fulfilling as it could be. That's the next thought. That's the, that's the next dangerous thought that follows on top of this. I want this other thing in my life. I don't seem to be getting it. I'm frustrated that I'm not getting it. Following Jesus hasn't quite been as fulfilling as I have wanted it to be. It hasn't quite satisfied me as much as I've wanted. And then the step that happens following that is you set aside Jesus in order to pursue some other thing some other belief, some other teaching, some other religion, some other belief system that says, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you that thing. It'll come through hard work and religious discipline, or it'll come through, you name it. It could be, there's lots of people out there that will tell you how to get what you want. I think these people were especially susceptible to this heresy, which remember, we talked last week, this heresy was a, Jesus is not the fulfillment of your life heresy. Set Jesus off to the side. There's something else that's going to fulfill and satisfy you. Jesus will help. And they were susceptible to this because I believe that across the board in this town, there was a sense of lack of contentment. And I want to see our church be a content people. There might be things in your life that you feel like if you check off the boxes of what a human being normally has in their life, that you're missing from that. Perhaps it's, perhaps it is money. Perhaps it's like, man, I've never quite had enough. Never quite had what I've wanted to have in terms of feeling good that I'm not maybe living paycheck to paycheck or that my bank account could have just a cushion in it. There's that always longed for that. Well, be careful. Perhaps it's companionship. Perhaps it's a spouse. 
Perhaps it's somebody you go, man, I look around and I see other people and they just seem so happy and they're married. And man, I would love to be married. That's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with saying, man, God, would you provide that for me at some point in my life? But how easy, friends, that can get to the point where it becomes an idolatry. It becomes a, if I don't get this, I'm not satisfied with Jesus. I think what we can do as a church that would be really helpful as a people of God is recognize when we're at number one on that list. Remember the feel strongly that you lacking something in your life. Recognize we're at number one on that list and repent of that right then and there. Like dig out that root. Help other, grab other believers and say, here's a, I got a root in my life. I got a root. We should be able to use that language as a church in our small groups and be able to say, okay, we know what that means. Like I got a root. It's, it's there. I know it's there. I'm confessing. Brothers, sisters, help me with this. Do it at phase one so that we don't get to three and walk away from the church because Jesus isn't giving us the thing that we want. Here's point number two if you're taking notes. God's people need to learn to be content with what they have been given in Christ. That doesn't mean that there aren't great things out there. That doesn't mean you can't ask Jesus for good things. Certainly a spouse, a family, children. If, that's, if you're a couple, you've been wanting to, trying to have children, and up to this point, God has not allowed that to happen. Man, wanting children is a great thing. My warning, my statement as a pastor is don't let it be an idolatry. Don't let it be something that robs you of your joy because you do, don't have it. That's where we're in trouble as Christians. That's where a root has dug into our hearts. All right, how do we do this? Just three application points and then we'll be done. Here, here's application number one. Remind yourself that Jesus will and can fulfill you. Let's just have a very simple, begin with a very simple recognition that Jesus is able to make you more satisfied than whatever that thing is that you're longing for. The greatest marriage on the planet, the greatest amount of wealth any person has had, the greatest amount of blessed children that are all wonderful and they never do anything wrong and it's just an amazing experience being a parent. Those things that are our dreams in our head, you name it, you fill in the blank on whatever yours is. Jesus can satisfy you better than that. You have to believe that first. You have to start there. Okay? Look at what Colossians chapter 2, 9 through 10 says. This is Paul helping the church get to this point. Okay? Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him, that's Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. You've been filled completely with Jesus Christ. And he is the great ruler who is ahead of all other authority, meaning nobody's ever going to come in and say, get out, Jesus, it's my turn to fill that heart. He'll never be replaced. He'll never go away. There is nothing anybody can do to you to separate you from Christ. He is your all-sufficient, all-fulfilling Lord and Savior. That's contentment. That's what that is. He's the one who fills you. How about this? Application number two. Seek what Christ offers, not what the world offers. Now, I don't mean just sin that the world offers. I mean that the world even offers good things, but maybe up to that point, Jesus has not, is not saying to you, I'm offering you that. Sometimes the problem is that we just, we don't want just what Jesus offers. We covet more. We want something more than that. Look at Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Paul says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not 
on things that are on earth. Do you see him dislodging that idolatry from people as he says that? He's dislodging. He's saying, set your mind on the kinds of things that Jesus will give you, has promised to give you. Because there are good things that he has not promised every person that will have. He's promised to fulfill all of us in eternity. Some of us will be, will have things that we don't receive that others do. It's hard. But contentment is what we're after. To trust Jesus in the midst of that. Application number three Pray, which decreases anxiety and increases thanksgiving. And we talked about this one a couple weeks ago, but look at Colossians 4, 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And I spoke a couple weeks ago about how the fact that prayer, when we go to God and we give to him what our needs are, and we lay it in his lap, Anxiety doesn't hang around when that happens. We've given that to him, and what we're left with is thankfulness. And thankfulness and anxiety are are like opposites. They kill each other. So when you have thankfulness in your life, boom, anxiety can be gone out of your life. Being thankful and watchful in prayer is the way in which we continue in this to be just content people that are filled in our love for Christ and, and, and willing to receive the gifts that he then gives us. You know what I think? I think, I think of the verse where it says, seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added unto you. And I always think, Jesus, why didn't you just tell us what the, these things were? And I think the answer is this, because these things is going to be different for every single one of you. Not all of you are going to have the same these things, but you know what you're going to get? You're going to get a lot of other things in your life that are joys, that are amazing gifts from the Lord. You didn't deserve them. You didn't ask for them. He didn't even require, he wasn't required to give them to you and he just loves you. But then there's also going to be those things where he says, out of my love for you and my mysterious timing that you don't understand, I'm not going to give you this thing. I don't understand that. I seek God all the time for things that I don't understand. Why, why, why God? Why, why don't I have this? And we learn he's teaching us in the lack to be content with him alone. And that's what I would love us to be, a contented people who is so in love with the Lord, so filled by him that no, no heresy, no false teaching, no alternate worldview is going to come along and derail us because we're satisfied. We're satisfied in the Lord alone. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's ask him to satisfy us in him alone. Father, we ask now that you would you would be our source of joy. That when we think of taking in and being filled and being fulfilled, that it would not include anything apart from you, even the greatest earthly gifts that we have. We would say they're wonderful, but they're from you. And you're our source. You're the joy. And as we take delight in those other things, Lord, may we take delight in you as the giver of the gift to us. May it all turn back to you as our great God and as our great fulfiller. Lord, I just pray a simple prayer. Help us to be a content people. Help my heart as a pastor to be a content person, to simply love you and be overjoyed with what I have in you. And Lord, help these brothers and sisters that are in this church, that whatever it is that they are wrestling with, that root that may be in their life, Lord, that they would dislodge it and be content with you and you alone. Jesus, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.